So the sermon you're about to hear is a retooled version of a sermon that I preached about four years ago. And I had several people walk out on me because I said some controversial things. Um, I've retooled it not necessarily because of the controversial things, um, but it was, I don't know, I guess it was at a time in this country when um, tensions were pretty high. And so I just want to start by saying if there are any sensibilities that are um, offended by any of the words that I have to say, uh, of course, walk out if you don't agree. Um, But if you would, indulge me for a little bit. You just heard a passage uh, talking about John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was kind of considered a predecessor to Jesus. He wasn't Jesus, obviously. He wasn't the savior of everyone. But um, he was not the nicest guy, but he spoke God's word. And so the sermon I'm about to offer to you, um, please receive it in that spirit. If you'd join me in prayer. Gracious and almighty God, I ask that the words of my mouth, the counsel you give all of us in our minds, um, that all of these things would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Christ, our rock and redeemer. Amen. So on September the 8th, 1925, the Sweet family moved into their new home at 2905 Garland Avenue in Detroit, Michigan. So the house was located in the midst of a white neighborhood that didn't want black families to move in. Um, But Dr. Ossian Sweet, uh, a black doctor intent on providing his family with a good life, moved his family in anyway. So the night that they moved in, a large mob of white families surrounded their home to protest their arrival to the neighborhood. Now fearing for his family's safety, Dr. Sweet asked nine of his friends and family to join them in the home the following day in the event uh, that uh, maybe their help was needed to defend their family and their property. So that night, a mob again surrounded the home and stones were thrown at the house. They broke a window. The men inside the house were armed, all of them. And fearing a home invasion, Henry Sweet, who was Dr. Sweet's brother, fired his gun from an upstairs window. He injured a white man and he killed another. Police were called and all 11 men in the home were arrested and charged with murder. So they asked the famous lawyer Clarence Darrow, who's a white man, to help with their defense. Now the media had whipped Detroit into a frenzy. I mean, racial tensions were high. Black people were being threatened all over the city, and there really seemed to be little hope for a non-biased trial, given that all the jurors selected were white. Now, Mr. Darrow understood from the beginning that the trial and its verdict would have a major impact on race relations throughout the country going forward, and spoke to that in his seven-hour-long closing statement. In the end, all the men except Henry Sweet were acquitted, though he would be acquitted later on as his actions were deemed in self-defense. Now, Clarence Darrow was known as a vehement liberal by his opponents and was known for defending lost causes as one of the most brilliant defense attorneys this country has ever seen. His work in the Scopes trial that landmark case where the Butler Act was tested. Uh, This was legislation that attempted to prevent the teaching of evolution in Tennessee schools. Now, he lost that case, uh, but it proved a turning point in the national discourse over what role religion should play in education. Darrow was known for being that contrary voice in the wilderness. He was an agitator. He was a challenger of social norms that he felt were unfair or immoral, but at the time were being accepted by a majority of people in society. And that brings me to the church. And not just our church, but so many churches across America this morning. See, the furthest thing from people's Christmas-addled minds is anything that might stir the pot that might challenge the status quo. In fact, we are at this moment even now 
doing everything possible to reduce our stress. I was doing that this morning, even if we're doing it in unhealthy ways. Tension is very high at this time of year because there's so much expectation. It doesn't take much to set people off. It's funny, though, because Christians are in the middle of Advent. This is a season where we take time to reflect upon what the birth of the Christ child meant for this world. Now, the birth of a child can be a joyous event. Amen? Yeah, but if everyone knew who Jesus was going to become when Jesus was born, I really don't think that the birth of the Savior would have been something every single person would celebrate, right? Herod. Yeah. But we do, right? We know the story. So I think a counter message sprung up over time that makes us want to forget about all of that. It would be very hard to sell all those gifts and decorations if the true meaning of Christmas was received and practiced. I mean, it's as if you can't go anywhere without some reminder that Christmas is coming, even here within these walls. It's like the closer you get to Thanksgiving, the more the messaging is out there. All the Christmas decorations are crying out to you. Celebrate! Celebrate! And our soul too, desperate as it is right now, cries out, Celebrate! Anything to avoid the truth of our current situation. Anything to keep the peace. Every voice that tries to remind us that the birth of Jesus has far less to do with celebration and far more to do with transformation is systematically told to be quiet, systematically told you're not welcome here. Now, the coming of the Messiah was meant to be the dawn of a new age, an age whose law is love, where God and humankind would be as one, and justice would roll down like waters, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. One lone voice in the time leading to the birth of the Savior reminded his people that the dawn of this new age was not necessarily something that everybody should celebrate. One lone voice reminded his people that the coming of the Messiah was something that people should be preparing for. You got to check to make sure your house is in order. And that had absolutely nothing to do with putting up decorations, stuffing yourselves with rich food, giving each other gifts, making sure people wish each other a Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays, or putting the right color on coffee cups. One lone voice cried, Repent. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now, John the Baptist had appeared in the wilderness. That's the word that Scripture uses to talk about it. He appeared in the wilderness, and he was preaching a message of forgiveness for people's sins. The natural end result of a journey that some people take to recognize how sin has ruined their lives and how they might find their way again. That message doesn't appeal to everybody. But to those who do decide to take the journey, it's life-giving. We call it repentance. Now, this message came from a man that looked nothing like what you or I would call a preacher. He wore no fancy robe or stole, certainly not a nice business suit, fancy clothes. He wasn't somebody that when you looked on him, you thought, you know what, I need to take this guy seriously. I mean, maybe when you saw him, you thought, maybe I just need to take my personal health and well-being seriously around this guy because I don't know what he's about to do. In his day, he might have even been called a sinner himself because he looked so down on his luck. 
if his daddy wasn't one of the temple's highest priests. His name was Zechariah. This man was clothed in camel's hair, that's what scripture said, ate locusts, mmm, bugs, wild honey, which is actually pretty good if you can get at it, and anything else the earth would grant him, the food of the poor, freely available, anyone that couldn't afford land to cultivate, you had to have money to have land. Oh, how that image contrasts with the sumptuous feasts we load our Christmas tables with. Imagine serving grasshoppers at Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. (laughs) He preached his message of repentance to a stubborn people, folks who didn't necessarily feel they had anything to repent about, to say sorry for, or who had already given up on the promise of the coming Messiah. Centuries had passed at that time since the Israelite nation was permitted to return home from Babylon only to then be conquered and ruled by the tyrannical Roman Empire. People didn't have a lot of faith left, you know? To folks like these, John must have been little more than a homeless crackpot. One more doomsday prophet wearing signs saying the end is near. The words of John in our scripture this morning are taken straight out of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40. You can actually refer to it if you like. It's all right there, Isaiah 40. The prophet is frustrated with the task God has set before him. A frustration any prophet or whistleblower has to ask themselves. Am I really going to go through with this? Think of all the scrutiny and hard work I'm about to go through. I'd rather just keep the peace, right? And so the prophet in Isaiah 40 asks God, What shall I cry? Or what shall I say in some translations? But they're not actually asking God for a message. They know the message. You know, like sometimes you know a certain truth, And maybe you beat around the bush a little bit. You you don't want to confront it, but you know, you know what's going on. That's how the prophet feels. He's not asking, what's the message? He's asking, what can I possibly say to these people? They have the attention span of a gnat. Their faithfulness withers in the face of adversity like so much grass which is actually what scripture says. They know the people. They know the resistance to change. They know the resistance to being held accountable for the state of things. Now, I think many of us know what it's like to try to warn people of something, and they just won't listen or act. Every parent knows this stress. It doesn't seem to matter how much you yell or you get mad. It's like they just turn off their ears. That is the prophet's despair. A voice from God is telling the prophet, this undeniable voice is telling the prophet, give people comfort that their savior is on the way. But hold up, they need to get ready for it. But the prophet knows that the folks can't or won't see beyond their current predicament. The prophet knows that the people are expecting a celebration, but what they should be preparing for is a transformation. And that's why trying to talk to folks about the real meaning of Christmas is very hard work. Trying to get them to prepare for the coming of a Messiah is hard work. As Americans, we've warped and twisted this holiday into something it was never intended to be. Christmas stopped being about Jesus' birthday. It became our birthday instead. We spend so much money on ourselves and loved ones this time of year in desperate displays of affection, but we neglect the poor. And not just the poor in finances, the poor in spirit. This is not a time for celebration for a lot of folks. What do you think Jesus thinks about what we've become? 
I mean, if Jesus were to come back like right now, boom, what would he think seeing all this Christmas hubbub, but watching the news and hearing about all the injustice? What would he think about our holiday dinners with their sumptuousness? Knowing that roughly 3,000 people, including families with children, experience homelessness and hunger every single night in Baltimore. If he were an invited guest at your Christmas celebrations, what would he think as you gave each other gifts on his birthday? And if he were to join us here in worship on Christmas Eve, what would he say to us? I'm just going to leave that an open question. People who bring up these kinds of questions are known as party poopers. Yeah. Nobody wants them at their parties. They get ignored. Praise God, someone saw fit to write down the words of John the Baptist. But eventually, Christmas does fade away, folks. It doesn't stick around. All the cheer and sparkle disappears for yet another year, and we realize that all those problems we worked so hard to ignore never left. They actually got worse in some cases. Just check your credit card statement. Yeah. And we're left to make ourselves sick again because we chose to ignore our problems instead of face them. So I'm from Southern California. Many of you here know that, some of you don't. I hate snow. It's a four-letter word to me. I think everyone here who has known me for some time understands how much I hate the snow and cold. That's another four-letter word for me. And I once heard snow described very wonderfully. Oh, I love the snow. Why do you love the snow? I love the snow because it covers everything with a beautiful blanket of white. And I'm like, yeah, but snow melts. Eventually, everything it covers over, you can see again. Yeah, but for those couple of days or weeks, I don't have to deal with it. That pile of leaves in my backyard, uh, maybe that rusted out hulk of a car that I have sitting in my driveway, everything just looks so pristine and white. Not for me. Because it's still there, right? It's still all under there. We're left to make ourselves sick again because we chose to ignore our problems instead of face them. We cry out for an end to these tough times. We cry out to God to save us yet again. But like the days Jesus walked the earth, no heavenly response comes, at least not the one that we were hoping for. And the credit card account is still maxed out. Our finances haven't improved. Our job prospects are still what they are. Our families are still broken. Nothing has changed, and God has not come to repair those things the way we thought God would. No parting of the skies. No descending of God from the heavens. No making the wrong things right. No celebration because we focused on the celebration when we should have focused on the transformation. But what if? What if for one Christmas things were different? What if instead of tuning out the party poopers, we started to listen to them? What if we took the message of John the Baptist very seriously, as many did in his day, to prepare the way of the Lord in our hearts to make straight in the desert of our lives a highway for God. To lift every valley up, bring every mountain low. To make all the uneven ground in our society level. To smooth out all of our rough places. What if we as Christians took that message each year? maybe just starting this year, and we prophesied about it to all our loved ones, 
showed them a way to stop ignoring the problems and face them at last. I mean, come on, if a family member of yours were sick and you had a life-saving cure for their illness in your possession, wouldn't you give it to them? You'd give it to them in a heartbeat. Of course you would. And if you were the one sick, wouldn't you take that medicine? I mean, unless you like living in misery and not facing the issues. No, you'd take that, medi- you'd take that medicine and, and you'd gulp it down. Even if it burned going down or tasted a little funny. I think then as now, people have given up on the possibility of the Messiah's return. Maybe what motivated us to turn this time of year into a celebration is so that we might experience the excitement of the Lord's return tangibly. That's how God works. God can take literally anything, even the worst of the worst, and turn it into something good. Maybe not in a way that we can understand at first, but if we would turn inward and think about it for a second, we might see the activity of the master there. Regardless of how far we've fallen away, we can help people believe in God's love again. But to do that, we have to be willing to set aside all distraction and really start asking ourselves the tough questions to face our inner darkness and start living as though there is a God of justice alive in this world. I'd like to conclude this sermon with a portion of Clive Darrow's closing argument in the sweet trial. He said, I do not believe in the law of hate. I may not be true to my ideals always, but I believe in the law of love and I believe you can do nothing with hatred. I would like to see a time when man loves his fellow man and forgets his color or his creed. We will never be civilized until that time comes. Gentlemen, what do you think is your duty in this case? I have watched day after day these black tense faces that have crowded this court. These black faces that now are looking to you, twelve whites, feeling that the hopes and fears of a race are in your keeping. This case is about to end, gentlemen. To them, it is their life. Not one of their colors sits on this jury. Their fate is in the hands of 12 whites. Their eyes are fixed on you. Their hearts go out to you. And their hopes hang on your verdict. This is all. I ask you on behalf of this defendant, on behalf of these helpless ones who turn to you, and more than that, on behalf of this great state and this great city, which must face this problem and face it fairly, I ask you in the name of progress and of the human race to return a verdict of not guilty in this case. May the spirit that caused John to open his mouth open yours and move you to do what is right.